Welcome and good morning. A lot of people, the first thing they asked me when I entered this room was, so where's your PPT? <laughs> I shocked them by saying I'm going to speak without a PPT. <laughs> okay, the reason for this, I think this time over the next two days, you're going to be inundated with data and PPTs and presentations and all the lot. And I thought it was not okay for us to start off with that. It's obviously a privilege to speak before Navneet. I know Navneet is going to put up a PPT, then that will kickstart the program. But uh, before I speak on what SIP is going to be all about, which is what the inaugural address I thought should talk about, a couple of things I wanted to state. Uh, first is thank you from the bottom of my heart for a recent NFO. We collected 1,900 crores almost. So thanks all of you for making it the second largest NFO in our history. Deeply, deeply grateful for that. The second is uh, that this is the last year of IFA Galaxy. It is going to become MFD Galaxy, right? It's also the last year as managing director of Sundaram Mutual Fund that I'll be addressing IFA Galaxy, okay? So I think both of them coincide together. And I take this opportunity. Please join me in welcoming Anand to my role. I'm sure he'll continue to support uh, MFD Galaxy in his new avatar. So that being said, right, you've chosen a very interesting uh, thing for the conference this year. That's Strive, Innovate, Prosper, right? And I was putting my head around it, and I know it coincides with SIP, which is resonating. Every investor today knows SIP, whether he knows mutual funds or not, right? But I think there's a deeper thought, and Babu alluded to it. I'm going to give it a slightly different twist. And the reason I didn't do a presentation was because I put my thoughts down in the article that I wrote for IFA Galaxy this time in the souvenir. So I'm going to be speaking along those lines, right? So what is this? First of all is that when you come into a knowledge summit, right, you can't be without a goal, right? And that goal has to be a long-term goal which helps you do something and become something, right? So I'd like all of you to take upon a goal that over the next two days, right, you should strive to grow your assets under management by 16 times over the next 16 years, okay? That's the kind of uh, long-term goal I want you to keep in mind because there's a lot of work which you need to do. We, we spend a lot of our time trying to, on a day-to-day, -day, go convince clients, prevent redemptions, get new SIPs. We lose sight of that long-term picture. And I think it's days like these where you set aside all of that and focus on and that's where what Stephen Covey said, in terms of the four quadrants, right? There are urgent things that take up your life. There are important things that you must do. But where must you spend 80, 90% of your time is on the things which are important and not urgent. Because the urgent important things will come and take your time anyway. And the urgent non-important things is a waste of time. And non-urgent non is useless. So focusing on that which is important for you right, which is very important for your success, right? Now, what is that, right? So when you then look at it, right, so striving is something that all of us, none of us is lazy. All the MFDs I know work extremely hard. So striving is a given part of our blood circulation. We strive from morning to night at all times. What is the key is that we have to strive smart. We have to allocate your energies and your efforts in ways which towards a goal. What is that goal? 16 bar 16. The one thing I'd like you all to take away from my talk today is 16 bar 16, okay? So then when you come to it, right, the role of innovation and the prosperity, right? Uh, Mr. Satya mentioned that is the prosperity of the customer, of the industry, of the mutual fund distributor. He said it's the customer who provides us everything. But I'd like to differ here. Why do I say that? I'm saying that we do not doubt the commitment of our MFDs to improving the wealth of our customers. So if we focus on ourselves, automatically the customer will gain. So I think to that extent, our hearts are in the right place. Whatever work we do is towards the customer. As long as we focus on our growth, the customer will automatically grow. A humble difference of my opinion there. So where I'm coming from then is that simple, right? How does this 16 by 16 I think will occur, right? So very, very simple. You, all of you have read history in your school. Your school teachers would not have let you go. You would have heard about the golden age of the Guptas. India's best period in our history was the Gupta period. 
right? Everything worked very well for India over four centuries. There were about six Gupta kings in succession, and India was the sinusure of the whole world, right? Everywhere, we exported our religion to Indonesia and to Vietnam and to Cambodia and all those places. We exported our pearls and diamonds, everything to the Western world. So that's the period which I believe India is on the cusp of, right? Now, when you say that, why is that true? This is true for certain structural reasons which we must accept and take it as a part of our life. What is that? First thing is that we never ever made an attempt to control our population, <laughs> right? An issue which yeah, I remember in the 70s, Mr. Sanjay Gandhi was trying to do this massive uh, you know, uh, inoculation drive for everybody and all of that and it failed. Today, thanks to that failure, we are enjoying what is called as the demographic dividend. Over the next decade, we are going to add 10 crore people to our working age population. The next highest is Indonesia with 4 crores and China is going to lose 3 crores. So the first reason why I'm saying is this has happened. This is not Mr. Modi has to come and trigger something to happen. This is already done and dusted. It's a part. In fact, it's a challenge. Because every action of any government that comes to power is going to be to provide employment to these people. So this economic factor, right, this socio-economic factor is going to drive our economic growth. So please have no doubt about that. The second thing which again, I would again drive it to population control. We failed in population control, China succeeded in population control. So the one family, one child policy gave a devastating blow to China because today, in the same next 10 years, China is going to lose 3 crore people from their workforce. And their decline is going to sustain for the next 50 to 100 years. Whereas for India, for the next 50 to 60 years, our population is going to rise. The reason I point out is that because China, not only with this population declining, its per capita income is six times of India's per capita income. So their labor is costlier than India's. Right? And politically also they are not in the right space. So all things are coming together for our country at the right time. Nobody needs to doubt that. You need to just take that as a part of the woodwork, that India's growth. So what does that growth mean? We are today already touching 7%. Let's stick to the same 7 to 8%, right? And let's say that we have a reasonable control over inflation. We bring it down to 5 to 6. So you are talking about a 12 to 13 percent nominal GDP growth for our country as a given, right? So that means that, and if you have anybody, you've heard number of speakers speak over so many years to you that in the long run, over a 15, 10, 15 year to, and I'm talking 16 years here, right? The stock market grows at least at the rate of the nominal GDP. So if you do nothing, keep your current customer happy, your assets under management are going to grow at 12% per annum. That's as simple as a task, right? So now, what do you have to do? You have to innovate to participate in the prosperity of the country. What is that innovation? So I would say that it comes from three or four spaces, right? So first, I would say the innovation is in your mind and your thinking. It's not that you have to come up with new products, the industry has to come up with innovative new products. Please don't get distracted by the word innovation. Innovation has to do the way you think. Why I'm saying this? You've heard this debate about passive plus active, right? In the case of mutual funds. I'm talking about passive plus active in a slightly different context. What is that? I'm talking about you as MFDs not being passive mutual fund allocators, but active mutual fund allocators, right? We all know, okay, buy and hold, keep it going for long. Our own mid-cap fund is an evidence. There are a number of uh, SBI, HDFC, the, you know, ICICI, those fund houses have long funds, delivered value. But that's only a core. Those funds is not that for every year they've been delivering the CAGR that you're looking at today. They have been through their ups and downs and their cycles, right? So for you to really make sure that your portfolio grows at a reasonable rate, your customer's portfolio, you have to be an active. Now, does this mean that you keep churning your portfolio? Absolutely not. What it means is that you invest in yourself in terms of knowledge to understand the economy, the business cycles of the economy, what's happening in the world, and choose assets 
the asset mix of your customer. So you have to become the primary asset allocator. And when you adopt the role of the asset allocator, it means that you will be active in your asset allocation, which means active in your choice of mutual funds. So the first thing which I would like to stress upon is that don't be a passive mutual fund allocator, be active. In the course of that active thought process, you could choose to retain some funds for the long term. It doesn't mean that every fund in your portfolio you keep throwing it around, right? That's number one. What is the second aspect of this? The second aspect of this is that this choice of the mutual fund can deliver to you. So the innovation that I'm talking about in your mind, I want you to focus on the word alpha, A-L-P-H-A. If I ask all of you what is alpha, no, it's the mutual fund beating the benchmark, that's the alpha. That's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about the MFD alpha. What is this MFD alpha I'm referring to? It is the percentage of additional returns you deliver over the average mutual funds by your choice. The mutual funds industry itself goes through its ups and downs. Your fund could go through ups and downs. Smoothening that by right, the mix of asset allocation is where I would like, love to call this advisor alpha, but regulations means that we have to call it distributor alpha or MFD alpha. So by your choice, by your active choice of the funds, choice of the fund managers, choice of investment styles, choice of growth versus value, choice of contra versus uh, in this, is the way that I think that you should be in a position to deliver at least a 2% alpha over a blind allocation to a mutual fund buy and hold over a lot. The second aspect is from your customer point of view. The innovation that I want to bring into your thinking is the fact that all of us are worried about our trail income, are worried about the fact that if you redeem something from a customer's portfolio, it's very hard to get it back. But I think that that is the one thing which I would say that we are neglecting. We are neglecting the fact that every customer must put his money into an asset class for a goal. And when that goal is achieved, it is your duty and responsibility to redeem that money and give it to him. That's the way you build long-term trust and you deepen the relationship with your customer. I think booking profits at the right time, which are in tune with the customer's life goals, his Silver Jubilee wedding anniversary, his daughter's marriage, his 50th birthday, you have to track it and make sure that you book profits and give it to them. Don't keep, we fear about the fact that if I redeem, oh, my AUM is going my trail. There has to be that amount of sacrifice, but it's an intelligent sacrifice because that will immensely strengthen the bond of you with your customer. That's number one. Second aspect to this whole profit booking thing is that when you then how do you know when to book those profits? I mentioned a few, uh, you know, timelines in their lives, but no. The second thing I want you to do, and though this looks very simple, right, I believe it's an innovation in your thinking because it's a differentiation. It is that I would urge you all, every single investment that you make of a customer, please link it to a goal, and that goal should be a non-stock market, non-market related goal. He wants to buy a Benz car, Pick one investment and say, this is meant to deliver that. He wants to go on a foreign cruise, pick an investment and do that. When you then do that, you have a goalpost against which you're comparing your performance. And when that comes near about the time, don't delay that till the very end. If that money needed to buy a Benz comes through a couple of years before, take it out, lock it in a liquid fund, lock it in a fixed deposit so that you don't lose that. So second is to make the customer join you in this process of goal setting and delivering those goals. That's the only way that you will really become a multi-generational relationship between you and the customer in terms of that, right? The third thing which I would like you to focus on from a perspective of this same innovation thought process is the fact that when you do this, right, the customer's emotional management, right, that's one of the things which I think a lot of effort from our side would be greatly, greatly helpful. And I think there needs to be a lot of training 
I don't know whether the next two days has a session, but managing the emotions, the fear and greed cycle, the panic when they see volatility in the market, right? And managing that has two elements to it. One is how do you emotionally handle, how do you use the right words, what do you do? But the second point there is that the concept of what I would call as shock absorbers. We have to constantly feature shock absorbers in your portfolio so that at the time of the shock, you can demonstrate that that part of the portfolio absorbed the shock, right? That action from your end that you're taking fully of his well-being and not only a fair weather friend, right, is a very important thing. What are the various shock absorbers? It starts with very simple things as, as much as multi-asset funds, right, multi-cap funds that you put in, flexi-caps, they help you absorb the cap curve related shocks, right? Second is multi-asset allocation funds, which add in debt, which add in gold. These are shock absorbers. So we often tend to neglect these kind of products when the markets are on a high. You are seeing what's happened to the BAF product over the last few months, right? People have lost interest in it because small caps are giving deliberate fantastic returns, then multi caps are giving them better. Why bother about BAF? This is the time for you to think about that. Right? Because shocks happen in the economy when least expected. Think those of you who are of my age or 10 years younger, 2007 second half, how many of you thought there was a GFC going to happen and the market was going to teach us a bitter, bitter lesson? Right? I would argue it was in single digits. Right? So build in shock absorbers is something that is going to not only actually prevent your customer's portfolio volatility, but also strengthen the bond with your customer, right? Please focus on the total revenue that you're getting. But despite all of the efforts through my, whatever, last two decades of interacting with the embassies, we have found that as an industry, we might haven't penetrated customers' wallets more than 10, 15, 20%. The customer is still hiding away his money from you in uh, real estate, everywhere. So I think that for you, once you get a holistic view, and where I'm coming from is that to build that trust in the customer where he exposes his entire portfolio to you is an absolute critical step, and all that I was speaking about is going to help you do that. And that's where you got to look at for a customer, not saying that every rupee that I extract from the customer, I earn a commission. You have to be advising him to put some money in bank deposit if the time is right, if it's from his risk profile it makes sense, you may earn zero commission. Right? You have to tie up with maybe a real estate expert, a will expert, everything. You have to become what I would like to call a financial supermarket to the customer, right? Through the process of building trust and being able to offer multiple product solutions to him right through his life, right? When you do that, I believe that automatically our penetration of that customer's existing wallet will deliver another 2% alpha to your AUM, right? And the third thing then we come to is if you have to grow your AUM by 16 in 16 years, what do you need to do? You need to get new customers. The penetration of mutual funds is pathetic in our country. It's what, three and a half crores in a 140 crore population, right? Even if you take 10% of the population is controlling 70, 80% of the country's wealth, that's 14 crore people. So getting new customers, of course, word of mouth from your existing customer will help, but you can't rely only on that. And that's where I'm sure over the next two days, you will have exposure to digital as a key means to acquire customers, how to use the social media to acquire. Those are critical skills where I think, given the low penetration, adding another 2% to your AEM compounded annual growth rate through new customer base addition over the next 16 years is a possibility. So where are we? We are at 12 plus 2, 14 plus 2, 16. And the final 2%, you leave it to the fund managers to deliver the active alpha. So that if you then achieve an 18% growth in your AEM, we know the rule of 72, right? 72, equal doubles in four years, eight times in eight years, 16 times in 16 years, right? Thank you very, very much. I think very simple, my thought process, my speech, I wanted to keep it focused on the fact, while I, I come back to Satya's point, that ultimately, as you saw from my speech, the customer is the center of our exercise, but we should have that confidence that whatever we do, when we do it for the customer, our growth will come with the customer's growth. Thank you very, very much. Have a good day.